Hi Nandan, thank you so much for taking out the time to talk to us about the digital public infrastructure approach and how countries can use it to achieve rapid inclusive scale. Starting off of course with the um, world famous India digital identity program called Aadhaar. What are some of the design principles that you used while building Aadhaar and how have they evolved over a period of time? Well, you know, after the elections in 2009, I got a call from uh, Delhi and the original thing was actually uh, whether I would be the HRD minister for India. Uh, but then, uh, for whatever reason, that didn't work out. And then I had written about ID in my book, Imagining India, which had come out the earlier year. And the government had been doing an ID project, which they had got cabinet approval for. So it all came together and I was offered the job of uh, chairman of UIDAI, which rolled out the Aadhaar ID in July of 2009. Some of the principles, one was minimalism, keep it simple, keep it minimalistic, uh, keep the number of fields the minimum, have a very simple use, like we only used Aadhaar for authentication and later on for KYC and nothing else, but do it at population scale. I think that are the principles, simple product but at population scale. So the, the power came not from the complexity of the product, but from the scale of its usage. That was a simple, that was a important principle and simplicity is now there in everything that we have done. But also uh, don't tread on anybody's toes uh, because in the government system there are many actors. Uh, so we didn't want to say we are an ID that replaces something else like a passport or a driver's license because then we would get into uh, conflicts. We just said we are a foundational ID that just says Ashok is Ashok, or John is John, or Mohammed is Mohammed, or whatever. And then others could build on that. So we don't, we don't take, take away anybody's agency. So the MEA still does the passport, but they just use Aadhaar to verify that John is John. So that principle of minimalism and separating out the functionality and keeping it simple and not intruding into other people's space were very important principles for its success. Was Aadhaar always supposed to be a digital identity? How did you achieve the balance between those who had access to like digital resources and those who didn't? Well, uh, the original uh, cabinet note that uh, set up the UIDI did not have the word digital at all. It actually just said give everybody a unique ID, which was actually quite a profound idea in itself. But how to do it was not clear, I think, uh, at least in the, in the plans. Uh, at that time, you know, we had a voter database and we had a, uh, you know, a ration card database and they said, oh, we'll take all these databases, we'll do some merging and all that. But that didn't look very practical when I took it up. So we decided to make it digital. We decided to take biometric uh, sort of a, a digital uh, pattern of every person to establish uniqueness and use technology to compare and decide whether the person is a duplicate or not. So those are all ideas that our team brought in. Uh, so the digital part of it came from us, from the team that I put together. So how did the initial Aadhaar team come together? Like where did you get the people from who could build a digital identity that would scale to 1.3 billion people plus? I had a very interesting uh, journey because uh, obviously from the technology side, uh, I needed some very good technologies who had global experience. So I, I I think Shrikant was probably the first, Shrikant Nadamuni, because he was my co-founder of eGov. So he, I, I roped him in and uh, then one day Pramod landed up, because I knew Pramod from his days at Infosys, some you know, 25 years back. So he landed up and saying, I want to be part of this. I said, join, join the gang and so on. So there was a bunch of guys, Raj Mashruwala was an old IIT friend of mine, landed up from California. So we had all these uh, people landing up. And the government side was also very interesting because I, I, I asked a friend of mine, K.P. Krishnan, uh, to help me find a great team in the government. And he put me on to Ram Sevak Sharma, who was at that time an IAS officer in the Jharkhand cadre. And Ram, Ram Sevak and I met in a hotel in Delhi and he said, Chalo, if you can do it, I can do it. So he joined me and then he also put me on to Ganga, who was our first CFO. She came from the Audit and Account Service and uh, people like uh, Ashok Pal Singh who was from the Indian Postal Service and Ra Rajesh Bansal who came from RBI. And uh, you, know, oh, you know, it was just a sort of a, 
this dispersed diverse set of people that we all uh, uh, brought, uh, brought together. How did these initial design principles help you to build newer and newer products besides Aadhaar? Over time we learnt a lot more things. We learnt about, uh, uh, I think Aadhaar taught us scale, uh, simplicity, uh, simplicity, minimalism, s single task at population scale, those kind of, those principles were. But I mean, we learnt also about interoperability a lot more, uh, how to make things real time. Uh, how, how to how to make uh, how to use AI, which came up much later. So over the years, of course, we have learned new things on how to build these kind of uh, uh, you know products. This is all very interesting. But can you explain for some of the people who might be confused as to what is the difference between this digital public infrastructure approach and other emerging technologies like AI, blockchain, etc.? API is is technology in the service of society. You know, it's not just technology and some new mumbo jumbo stuff coming. It's about how is all these technology which are out there, can we repurpose it in a way that common person benefits? Can, can a billion people benefit? Can, we, can a billion people get access to uh, opportunity? Can a, can a billion people get included through an ID and a bank account? Can a billion people get loans? See, so everything is from the point of view of how do societies benefit? I think that's the big difference of DPI, which is why it's so relevant that it's actually about technology in the service of society and people. So building and scaling Aadhaar couldn't have been easy. What are some of the challenges that you faced on the way and how exactly were you able to overcome them? Obviously the team was very good, uh, worked together, passionate, big ideas, long-term vision, all that. But everything we have done, there have been many times when we have felt we have reached the end of the road. I mean, in Aadhaar, I remember at least five or six occasions when I said, okay, the game's over. Because there was some, it was reaching a point where uh, it, it looked like it couldn't go further or it was going to be stopped or crippled or whatever. So I think the trick was to keep working, you know, whatever be the uh, adversity to be able to go forward. Like, I mean, my Srikar was my OSD. Uh, he was my uh, PS. Srikar is IAS officer from Karnataka. So he, he would help me in navigating the government uh, things. But we had, op we had oppositions from within, from without. So we just had to deal with this. When we did UPI, there was a lot of resistance from some of the banks because they're opening up payments to anybody. So I think anything we have done, there's obviously somebody who feels, uh, uh, you know, that it's going to be a threat to them. So one thing I find really fascinating is this interplay between private sector players as well as the government. So how does DPI encourage a coming together of the ecosystem, including both these parties? It can be private-led. For example, the work we do in, say, Beckon Protocol, it's entirely market-led. So we're enabling a protocol for open networks. Then it's up to a company to use that way of thinking to create a new way of doing mobility like Namayatri or ONDC. So I think over the years we have evolved to think about DPI as nothing but rails that are available publicly. Whether they're done by the government like Aadhaar, they're done by a non-profit like NPCI or just a protocol like Beckon. There are different forms it takes. Uh, so all these lead to uh, essentially public rails that enable private innovation. What is the importance of the digital public infrastructure approach when you look at solving uh, population scale challenges both in India and across the world? The last couple of years there's been tremendous uh, uh, appreciation of the Indian uh, model of DPI and uh, the G20 where India was the presidency for the last one year helped in putting the whole DPI idea forward in front of many countries. So I think we are seeing uh, amazing things happening. I mean, uh, Bangladesh has done so much good work in KYC and, and so on. Brazil has built the PIX platform for payments. Uh, uh, Philippines has built an ID system. Uh, Sri Lanka has used the digital vaccination certificate from India. Uh, Morocco has built uh, an ID system and so on. It is now becoming uh, much more prevalent and now there's this grand ambition of 50 countries in five years. And there's a global coalition, you know, whether it's the uh, DGP Alliance, Digital Public Good Alliance, IMF, World Bank, United Nations, UNDP, 
WHO or Organized India like CDPI and so on. So there are many, many people coming together uh, to make this happen. What is the advice or suggestion you would give to other countries who are looking to implement the digital public infrastructure approach in their own countries? In some sense, it is easier because when we started, it was an unknown unknown. We didn't know what we were going to do. Now it's a known known. We, we know what is happening. We, we can see it. So that uncertainty of unknown has gone away. Now we are, and then the tech issues have also gone away because all this has been solved and we have open source solutions and all that. And we know how to do it and so on. But still, if countries have to do it, one, they have to believe in it. So it's about conviction. Uh, they have to have political capital behind it. So it has to be the highest levels. And then somebody has to take leadership in aligning everybody in that country to roll this out at scale. But this will definitely, in my view, digital transformation is the only way that the world can uh, go from middle income or low income to high income. The only way that you can be inclusive, the only way that we can do the climate transition. So the benefits of this is so, so huge. We should go all out for this.